Hi. Well, I guess welcome to, to Hydra Conf, you know, 2020. This is the new world order of COVID everywhere. And, uh, and I'm here today to talk about debugging data races. Um, and this is very much a part of uh, concurrent programming. You know, what, what goes on with the data race and why they show up all the time and why they're harder to debug than sort of the usual thing. Um, and I guess I'm going to roll on in my usual talk style. I have, let's see if I can check my camera here. I have a, a, a pattern of talking very fast, and I know it's foreign language speakers. I guess you're just going to have to bear with me. Yeah, a lot of fun stuff to talk about here. So I'm going to start with a, an example. Um, and so this is, you know, short debugging tale. And uh, the example is real, uh, and I simplified it a lot already. Um, I've debugged this example, dozens of variations of it, and it's one of the most common forms of data race. And of course, if you look at the code, um, it doesn't really look like a data race or a bug of any kind, and there's a lot of stuff going on. So let's read it through real quick. <laughs> if um, <coughs> some method has code, uh, if it doesn't, return false, get out. If it does, get the code, do some setup, and then execute it. So there's a, a, a null check for the uh, you know has code, there's go get it. Uh, sometime later you execute it and now it's no, and it wasn't when you tested. And what the hell happened? So this is sort of the canonical example of a data race where, <laughs> excuse me, you're uh, reading some stuff and you're using it and a short time later you use it again and it's not the same value as it was before and you get these rare crashes. Huh? So let's, let's go down the path of what a data race is closer to what the CPU sees, because this understanding what a data race is goes a long way toward understanding of how you can work about fixing them. So it's basically, you can read the slides, two threads accessing the same memory, one's writing, and there's no intention to order the writes or, or the reads here. So I'm just getting my copy. So, you know, really what's going on here is you want to use more than one CPU because one CPU is too slow because, you know, frequency scaling ended 20 years ago and we all have whatever, two and a half to three and a half gigahertz machines. But, you know, there was a day when you could wait a, a year and your machine got, you know, 50% faster. And that time has passed a while ago. Okay, so let's look at this in the, the timeline of a processor or a pair of processors. So this is two threads in a shared memory where the thread one reads some code value, that's the actual inline implementation of my short debugging tail, and tests for null and jumps. And then it reads it again and runs off and uses it in some exec call. Whereas thread two is a background task that's periodically cleaning a cache, and at some point he sets the, the, you know, the variable to null. And if the timing's wrong, it's in between the two, you're gonna die. So it's two threads, they're accessing the same memory, one's writing, there's no ordering written in the code, and you're okay if that write happens before the first read or after the second, and broken if in between, and that's just random potluck based on thread scheduling. It'll randomly crash, you know, rarely in testing, but if you get more context switches, it'll crash more often, say, under heavy load. So in this particular case, the crash is routine in production settings and not ever in testing. Okay, why do loads and stores move about? How can they reorder? Well, a compiler can totally reorder them for scheduling purposes, for average code speed improvements, and compilers do this on a routine basis. This is a very common, as soon as you go to dash O, to dash O2, anything like that in a compiler, code's gonna move. Hardware can move it as well, and in particular, an x86 is uh, both very conservative and very aggressive about moving it. They, they, they limit the kinds of motions they do, but because of the nature of the x86 hardware, in order to get its performance out, where it is allowed to move things, it will move them aggressively, typically to cover cash missed costs and give a better, higher throughput. So unless it's explicitly denied via you know, keywords like block, um, you have to have ordering or things might change. So let me look at this for a second again, where, uh, you know, if I'm just doing two writes and can I fail, two writes on one side and two reads on the other, as opposed to, uh, you know, the, the first example. And here's a case of, you are basically double check blocking. I'm going to write some stuff into a, a data field. I, I build good things, whatever it is. And then I set a flag saying it's initialized. 
And the second guy says, read the initialized flag. If it's not, I probably take the lock and test again and then initialize it. But if it is, then grab the data and run. And this is you know, classic double check locking. And of course the compiler can reorder and he might put the store of one in front of the other. And then he loads the data before he tests the flag. Uh, and, and the, you know, the data is stale and by the time it gets to the flag, the flag is set and, you know, boom, got the wrong answer. You can fix this by using, you know, volatile keywords, I guess in C++ Atomic now. What if I don't have the compiler reordering? Can the hardware reorder? And of course, the hardware can reorder in a lot of different ways. Um, in particular, the first load can miss in your cache and be very slow. But an x86 will then make a prediction. And if he predicts that it's true, he'll speculatively load the second data. Now, if the first one comes back the wrong way, he'll take that branch, the failout branch, and go off and do other things and probably end up reloading data and it's all great. But if the second load comes back, the second uh, init comes back, um, he'll take it. His prediction's correct. He got the data value he wanted and he uses it. And of course, that data value happens before the right of stuff into data. And so you, again, you get speculative, you get, uh, uh, you get incorrect stale data. So you have to have a memory barrier. And the memory barrier um, is an ordering bar to the compiler, can't shuffle these loads or stores across the bar, but also it's some sort of barrier to the hardware to move things. And an x86 will by default put one of these barriers in all the time, um, but other hardware, say an AMD, like, you know, my phone's running an AMD chip. I don't know there it is. Phone here. Yeah, yeah, the phone. Different chips will do different things here. Um, and so they can totally reorder without a memory barrier. So you need a barrier. And you need one on both the load side and the store side. So here's the load side barrier. Just an example I did a second ago. Um, a missing load order. So the init gets moved by the hardware past the load of the data. The data happens too early. The init comes in late. Prediction's true, but the data's stale, boom, dead. Also, you can do the same thing if you're missing a store ordering. And that would be a case where data is written, but it's in the processor thread one's cache and doesn't actually uh, hit main memory for a while. Maybe data is actually big and it will take a while to get to main memory, you know, a while in processor time. But the init flag is fast. Maybe it's in a shared L2. And so the write gets seen immediately by thread two, who then picks up, you know, does this barrier and, and then reads the data bar afterward, but the stuff wasn't available, so what he read was in stale. The, the moral of that story is you have to have ordering on both threads, both the read side and write side must have some kind of ordering. Okay, so that's enough on what the hell a data race is. Um, let's go look at some common data races. So this is about debugging data races, so let's look at some things that people write that are data races. So these are my experiences only, although I have read up a bunch of papers and people trying to look for data races and, and various kinds of other places. And I'm showing you what are, are common ones. So the first one is what we looked at when I started with here. I've tested the field for null, and then I used it to go do something, chase a pointer, p.field. Um, but a second thread came in in the middle and did a null right in between those two. And the, you know, the bug here is basically I'm loading it twice and in between the two loads, something changed. And the first time I loaded, it was the test, but the second time I loaded, it was already dead. So, and, and usually the write is a null write. It can be another different thing, but it's usually a null write. So another one here is uh, two writes with a read in the middle. And on the left, I'm taking an uh, array list, a Java standard array list, and I'm resizing it. It's a doubling uh, operation. The, the array gets made twice as big. So your size field is double, and then you allocate a new array of twice the size, and then you copy from the old to the new. Whereas the second guy is doing a last operator where he asks for the end element of the array, um, and he does that by asking for size, which if you're in the middle of this copy, it's size minus one is the double value. It's off the end of the array, and you blow out with an array index out of bounds exception. So again, it's the wrong answer. However, the answer is done. There's a couple different ways. Double check locking we'll go into in more detail, but I got enough to, to at least give you the hint of it now. You test a global, uh, and if it's null, it, the, some static global you want to initialize has not been initialized, but multiple threads are racing to find it. So you synchronize and test again in case somebody else is synchronizing on it. Uh, and, and then if it's still not done, then you make a new allocation and you write it. And the problem here is that the, the, the 
host of it here, double check locking. The problem here is that there is a memory barrier because they're synchronized and it's in the wrong place. So thread one has already done a, a test outside of a lock, decided it wasn't available, locked, tested inside the lock, decided he owns the lock, it's not available, he's gonna make it. So he busily computes some good thing for whatever he's gonna put into your global variable. He's filling it into uh, 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 memory storage, and then he writes the global variable to publish the value. Whereas thread two tests the global to see if it's available, and then he goes and reads the data through by chasing through the pointer that he just read. And the problem is the memory barrier is in the wrong place, the stuff you're writing, the good thing you're building is, say, a little bit big. It, it's in cache, but not to main memory. Thread 2 is does not have it in his cache. He reads it out of main memory as stale. And so even though there's locking going on here, it's in the wrong place. And the fix, of course, this is an old one, is to make global volatile. Um, this kind of pattern, though, can show up again and again and again in a lot of different variations in concurrent programming. It's, it's an easy one to screw up with. So let's go back on the double read one. So in this case, I, I have one guy who's going to read a value, test it against null. It's not, so he's going to load it again to go chase the pointer and do something with it. And in this case, you have two loads, and a compiler likes to CSC. That's common sub-expression them together. Use one load to cover them both. And if you do that, um, there's no bug because there's only one load and you can't have a write in between them, in between one, right? However, if you're writing C code and you're running in a debug build, you might have two loads, but not in a product build. In Java, the situation's a little more subtle. The crash will typically happen before the high optimizing JIT kicks in. That is, when you heavy load hits your system, you begin to do a lot of context switching and a lot of jitting all at once. But the load's hitting the system now, so it's running in the interpreter. The interpreter is running the two loads as separate bytecodes, as separate loads, they're independent. You haven't jitted yet, and you have a much higher odds of having the, uh, the context switch necessary to get the, the null right in between. So if you get past startup, you've been jitted, and now there's no bug. But during startup, you might crash here and the bug might persist for years. And I have plenty of personal experience to say bugs like this have started and been around for years um, because basically, you know, the server's freaking flaky and you hate the server, but if the server makes it up, it's up and it's good and you can leave it. But if it crashed on startup, you're annoyed and you kill it and you restart it and it worked the second go around and you forgot about it and moved on. Very frustrating. Okay, let's look at another example here. Clever with hash map. So this uh, happened to a couple guys. Um, who should have known better. Both were, you know, high-end engineers, uh, one from a three-letter acronym company that's been well known for making computers for a very long time. And they're using HashMap, and it's a common case where you have a rare writer and many readers. And, and this is a common caching case. All kinds of web services have caches where there's a 99% read rate and a 1% write rate. You're most reading, and the cache is mostly working, and it's doing the right thing. It's all great. So in order to run faster, you don't want to synchronize on the readers, so you can have parallel concurrent readers and just one writer. Um, so readers, you know, since there's only one writer, you don't need locking, that's the thinking. And readers will sometimes see half of a put, like a writer mid-progress. And if they do, they'll occasionally make an old pointer exception, which you can catch and then retry. So this is, you know, Java specific here, but nonetheless, it was, I've seen it more than a few times. Um, however, the situation is a little more complicated. The writer can be mid resizing and the reader hashes to the larger table, uh, but he does the lookup on the smaller array and then he throws an array index out of bounds, which is not caught, um, but it can be. And if it's not, then you, you know, you die that way. But there's a more subtle bug that's much more insidious. The readers call size, which at some point can call resize because it decides the table has too many uh, probes that are failing. It wants to grow the table and, and lessen the load factor in the table. So the reader is now resizing the table. And a second reader can fail the same test if it comes in at the same time in the same way. And you have multiple readers rewriting the table. Well, that's not thread safe code. And multiple readers are copying elements from one table to the next. And it's easy enough for the linked list of the buckets, you have collisions, that's why you're resizing the table. 
So there's a link less, the list gets corrupted. It gets cyclic. Now, when you're done resizing and you go probe the table, you hit this uh, uh, cycle in the bucket list and you chase down the list looking for the element in question, but you're in a cycle spinning forever. Well, this is on a web server. So eventually the transaction times out and it retries. And the retry thread hashes to the same thing because it's doing the same transaction and fails the same way and hangs the same way. Each time it fails, the thread is lost to the server, but not to the, to the OS or the core CPUs. It's burning through that cycle endlessly, burning a CPU. And at the rate of one per timeout, which the timeout might be you know, 30 seconds to a minute, you lose a core to the hash table burning forever, spinning down a linked list forever and a day, and as slowly the server grinds to a halt. It doesn't crash with an immediate exception fail. It grinds slowly to a halt. And of course, if you just reboot the server, it's all good again. So very insidious bug. Okay, so let's go look at some debugging techniques. Enough on what it is. Let's go state, see what, what we have here. Actually, I'm going to drink my coffee. Okay, so there's sort of three main things that people think about, and then I'm going to pull out a bunch of other tools that you've not probably thought about for doing uh, this kind of work. Visual inspection is a, is a main one. You look at the code. It's sort of state of the practice. It's very slow, but it's what people typically do. You put prints in, and I say printing in a very loose way. You put something in, logging of some kind, that helps you uh, understand the ordering of events. And of course, you get into the Heisenberg syndrome, where you've changed the timing, and because you change the timing, um, the bug goes away. It's, it's effectively you added sleep or some other stall or delay, or you put ordering in because the the uh, the printf is ordering under the hood on a single output write stream. Whatever it happened, you change the timing, the bug went away. You remove the prints, the bug's right back. And then there's static analysis tools which have been around forever today and been widely looked at as heavy research things. I'll talk more about them later. Um, I look at this every few years. They're still not good enough for sort of prime time usage cases. Um, I'll recommend find bugs in its current follow on format. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, let's look at visual inspection here. Just make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, it's really easy to get started with. You look at your code. Yeah, right. You can work on core files. You don't have to have actual source code. You can look at, you know, the crash dump afterwards. Um, sometimes it's hard to get the code. That can happen if the bug is in a third party library and you'd love to have the source code, but you're doing Java. So you got Java class files or your C code and you've got a lib C or some other lib that you don't have source code. Um, it's very slow because it's a person looking at code. And, and sometimes you can get a more directed search by understanding what you think is going on, where the fail should or should not be. Um, but you, you're basically paying Sherlock Holmes, a detective, looking you know, with yourself. What happened if I do this? What happened if I do this? And then this and this. But I tested this here and it failed over there. And, da, 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 and you go round and round. You have to be a memory model expert. You have to be a domain expert. You have to understand your problem very specifically, very well. This is what I'm trying to solve. But you have to be a memory model expert as well. So it just doesn't scale. Um, yes, I do it, but it's not fast and there's not a lot of clips floating around. So this is not a great answer. And one of the biggest flaws here is simply not knowing uh, the players, not knowing what variables are actually shared. I have talked to many concurrent program writers who think they know what the shared variables are until you go into a deep dive with them on who's doing what with what, and suddenly they discover that there are other variables that are shared they hadn't thought about, or what threads at what time frames can share them, or when they're allowed to touch or not touch. And so it, sometimes it helps to make the threads, uh, the, sorry, the, the shared variables obvious with big flashy comments, right? Or annotations, some sort of at locking annotation saying this variable access should be covered by this lock always. And then, you know, third party tools can reach out and, and look. Um, the other thing going on is that you can look for common failures. So, you know, like the common cold, common failures are common. Uh, and, and there are particular few that have a particular rote pattern that's sort of fairly straightforward to look for. So in particular, the double read, um, 
it's usually hidden behind accessors and you have to change your accessor patterns to make it work. So, so the sort of the canonical, you know, good way to write this code might be to say, if something is ready or is initialized or however you want to word it, uh, then go get the value. And that pattern fails because the is ready call does a load and the get call loads the same value. And the fail is, you know, the value got changed in between. Right. So you can return the flag and the value in one shot, cache it in local variable. So temp gets get, which has a poison value, which is null as an obvious poison value. But people do things with a, a, a maybe and optional and those kinds of, you know, don't use null. Um, that's your poison value. It's still fairly efficient. But you have a value that says it's not available and a value that says it is available. And both of them are stored in the same variable. And you do one read, test for available and use it if you have it. Right. And if you don't have it, don't read again. So you can't use the same accessor patterns. And in particular, every field uh, load and store that is part of the, the concurrent algorithm writing has to be inspected and needs to be explicitly, you know, and here I do a load and here I do a store so that you can find them and verify the concurrent algorithm. So the other big flaw with visual inspection is forgetting what I'm going to call is the cycle. And this is because, um, well, because you don't think about it this way so often. So you have some code, it does something. And typically there's a start point where maybe I acquire a lock or I do it. If global is null, then synchronize lock. If test again, you do some start. Then you do a thing where you use the values you just checked on. And then you end where you clean up and you unlock, perhaps. Um, and so you carefully visually inspect the start, do, end sequence. But this is being repeated in an infinite loop inside the program endlessly checking your cache getting from cache it's no it's not using the cache value and going again so, so you have a cycle start do in stuff start do in stuff start do in stuff over and over and over and over again and you have threads that are doing end something else unrelated and start at the same time you have some doing start doing something and end and the ends and the starts overlap in all possible combination you chase each other's tail so here's an example, and this is again a real example, where thread one is busy, read the code, test it, read the code, use it, read the code, test it, it's not set, read the code, use it, read the code, test it, read the code, use it, down the line, read the code, test it, read the code, use it, read the code, that's what it's doing, it is in the cycle. Thread two is doing a different cycle, read the code, test it, wipe to null, read the code, test it, wipe to null. Those two patterns, when looked at from above, work fine. But when looked at from the other direction, there's a fail path at the bottom here, where finally I hit the other side of the cycle, where thread one is doing you know, read a code, test it, read a code, use it. But thread two did his task, but he's on the tail end and he writes the null, and that's the overlap, and I get a crash and burn. So it, it's a it's a mindset when you go look at concurrent code to understand where your cycle is and make sure that you're you're doing the right thing there, you're checking the right thing. Okay. Let's switch over to printing here. This one's a little more direct. Okay, make noise, printing, make noise at each read and write of a shared variable. Let's say make noise, just some sort of logging thing. And then if you get a crash, you have a trace of these events and you know, can serialize, I'm sorry, collecting the log typically serializes, which changes your timing, hides your data rate spikes. Um, also, the OS can buffer per thread. So that's WYSIWYG. I don't know if people still remember that term. It's what you see is not what you get. Uh, and that's just, you know, per thread buffering. So the, 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 the log on this guy and the log on this thread are not interleaved. They're like, or whatever, they're out of order. So you get a Heisenberg symptom. Never crashes when you print. Similarly, it never crashes when I attach to it the debugger. Totally happens to me. Eh, kind of commonly, it's been a little while now, um, but when doing heavy concurrent programming, I'll get bugs all the time that never crash under the debugger, which is effectively a version of printing, because the debugger reads the variables and displays them in a pretty window for me, and it's basically reading them. Um, or it'll die, for instance, uh, in production, but not on my desktop, because the machines are slightly different and they have different performance characteristics. So, cheaper printing. I have this hack for Heisenbugs. Write event tokens, ints, integers, to a per thread ring buffer. So let's break it down. What am I talking about here? A per thread buffer. 
because I don't want any contention for writing, no locking. So it's per threads, there's no locking going on. Um, I can't do any uh, complex strings. I'm not printing a string. I'm not doing a classic log file where I print a string. Because strings have a high cost related to them, besides bulking up your GC, they actually, the actual cost to make a string is higher than you might think by a fair amount because it invariably means you get a cache miss when you do a new allocation. 100% chance your new object you're just making, the new car array, the new string header are not in your cache since the last GC cycle. 100% chance it's a full cache miss. That's your stall right there. And, and that's the Heisen button, right? The next one is I use a ring buffer because I'm not logging and printing everything out because it's too slow. Instead, I simply throw away things older than the size of the ring buffer. As long as the ring buffer is big enough, however big enough means, um, no blocking, no IO, it's very, very much less overhead. In fact, it's down to a handful of clock cycles, and that's very much less likely to hide the bug. Works distributed, same as uh, concurrent, you know, shared parallel machines as well. I, I debug H2O's clustering communication strategy using this. That was, you know, UDP packets where they bypassed each other over the wire and had all kinds of weird out of order timing events. Okay. When I get done with this technique, I have a ring buffer. It might have a thousand or 10,000, however big I make it, series of events per thread. And I have a crash. And now what do I do? So I add ordering by putting a system.nano time in that buffer as well. And the nano time call is, again, it's extremely cheap these days. It was never very expensive, but it's good enough. Um, but it's also just a handful of clock cycles. It's not milliseconds. That's more expensive in the order of you know, expense things. Nano time's cheap. And then I have a call I can make from the debugger that post processes the crash, grabs all the ring buffers, sorts them by nano time, and does a line by line print in order as every thread viewed it according to their nano time. And I get a timeline of events just prior, just after the crash. And almost always, a 99% chance, the guilty thread, the guilty point in time stands out. Really cool technique. Pretty darn heavy weight. Need to know when to use it. I don't pull it out very often because it's a pain in the butt to set up and go. Every time I've pulled it out, I've always found my, my data race. It's, it's a useful trick in your tool bag. Speaking of tools. Most of the tools are just not ready for prime time after 20 years. They don't scale. They come with baked in 10x slowdowns um, or high, high false positive rates or the required PhD to use. And it is a common pattern that you'll have a tool that's pretty reasonable in terms of slowdown, but it's so difficult to use and understand that you need a, a lot of skill in using the tool. And, oh, look, there's a company that maintains the tool that sells you consulting time where they bring their own PhD to the table to solve the problem for you. These people exist. I've never used them. I assume it works. Um, but you yourself using the tool, be prepared to burn a lot of time understanding how that tool works. I can recommend FindBugs, uh, which Google obviously uses in its later incarnations um, at, at very large scale. And it does simple pattern matching. Uh, and, and, and because of that, it only finds the common bugs, like the common cold, not the COVID-19, but the common cold, it's called common for a reason. People get the common cold all the time. You have common bugs all the time. That's why they're common. So it finds an interesting set of bugs. It won't find them all, but it's easy to use and it can find, definitely find an interesting set of bugs. Okay, <clears throat> now I'm gonna start uh, bringing out some, some other things here. Where am I at here? Okay, yeah. Um, so, I can protect against an unexpected data race if I suspect one, but I haven't proven it to myself. That this is where the bug is. By locking uh, unlocked collections that are, or, or locking things that I think are involved, even when I don't expect there to be a race there, there's not supposed to be any lock contention. And in the land of Java, a no contention lock is very low cost. So if there's no data race, it's pretty damn low. Now you might have some latencies that you really need to work through. And so you don't want to pay that even that much cost. Um, but if you're writing something that's got some amount of stall built into it already, you're trying to fight a bug, throw some locks in. If there was no lot, no contention, there was no cost either. Okay. And the other thing you could do here is simply use a, a try lock approach where uh, you, you take the, the collection with a try lock, 
if you win, you have it. And then on unlock, you test, you check a bit to make sure no one else tried to get it, and then you unlock and you get out. Whereas if a second guy does come along and he try lock, he fails, that's unexpected because it wasn't supposed to be contention here. So he sets the fail bit and he throws an exception. And when the first guy who owns the lock goes to exit, he'll see the bit, he'll throw his exception, and he gets a stack trace at both reader and writer at the point of the crash. You've done it before. When it works, it's fabulous. You get two threads. They just stop, halt, throw stack traces, each one claiming they were competing for a shared resource they, they should not have been. Okay, other proofs. Um, formal proofs, not ready for prime time. Hardware designers make it work for them, but they have a different problem state they're working through and a different cost model of, of development. Um, statistical fails. I'll talk about that in a little bit here. You know, what happens when something fails X often? Um, there, there are people who've done some really cool work where they have large uh, audiences that they're uh, putting builds out to. And so they can put a build out, you know, like versions of Firefox and Mozilla, the earlier versions would have this where they put custom builds out that had most of the search turned off because they were too expensive, but a few turned on statistically, and they would get statistical sampling back from their uh, audience of people who did upgrades. And they could kind of guess what happens this often, see what's going on. I built a couple of homegrown tools, but like the ones that have a 10x slowdown and required a PhD to use. Um, these were difficult to set up, but they happen when they when they were set up and working well, worked really well. I could step people through them. I don't have time now to do it. Um, some fun concepts here. That's a nearly infinite store buffer is simply stall all stores until you have a language level ordering that demands the stores happen. But that only happens if you're running under a simulator, which the early Azul boxes were all running under simulation. So the slowdown was actually due to the simulator. Worked great. Eh, no time. We'll do, we'll do come back to it first time in Q&A. Let's look at uh, testing concurrent code. And this is, um, you know, this is sort of the QA folks uh, uh, side of things as opposed to developer, but it applies to developers in the sense that a lot of the tools are bring up land on the developer's desk at some point. Okay, so what's the difference between testing, concurrent, and sequential code? Well, there's a bunch of them, they're obvious, right? One's deterministic, one's not. One, you can get code coverage. And one, you're very unlikely to have even the minutest amount of state coverage, no matter how hard you try. One is repeatable and reliable, one has this Heisenbug property where you change the timing just a little bit and the bug goes away. And one is language-defined results when you change the hardware, you change the amount of memory available, you change the load of the device, a bunch of things can be changed, but the language specifies the exact meaning and you get that exact answer. Whereas concurrent code, the language does not specify the meaning, changing the hardware, changing the memory layout, the, the GC, changing the, the load, like the heap size, changing your production servers versus your, your continuous integration testing versus by desktop or all different kinds of servers, all can change when concurrent bugs happen. You get new failure modes, you get deadlock, you get live lock, you get missed signals and notifies, you get atomicity and synchronization failures, you get data races, you get performance failures because you were doing concurrent code because you're trying to get performance out. But under some situations, you lost the performance while you were incorrectly or you're overlocking and being, you know, correct, but too slow to matter. So, you know, failures in one are same input, same failures, same output. You can sit down the debugger and start basically doing binary search kinds of things to hunt down the bug. But failures in concurrent code are probabilistic, might require, you know, very unlucky timing to crash. So, to start with, split out concurrency and application logic in your testing side, because your application logic can be tested like it's single threaded code. Normal single threaded testing applies. I'm not going to talk more about it here. This is a good way to test whether or not my banking app or my mobile app or whatever behaves how I want it to behave when there's no concurrency going on. Right? It, it shows the screens, it has the right layout, it goes to the database and back and gets the results and whatever, it's doing the right thing there. And then you'd love to be able to test the concurrency without the app complexity. And you can only go so far here, but you can often break them out pretty far and have a mock for the app, but hammer it on the concurrency side to get the testing of that. It's two different pieces that you're testing here. You know, one might be the pretty picture and one's the nasty gear meshes on the inside. There's a different plan here for testing. So the goal of QA is not to find all the bugs because that's impossible. 
The goal of QA is really to increase your confidence. And there's a couple of techniques we're gonna talk about, some of which you've heard about, and some of which might be new to you. So um, education, training, careful design, this is sort of common things. Um, code reviews as part of the QA process. Static analysis tools like FindBugs as part of the QA process. Testing including specifically uh, variations on unit integration load testing uh, that are designed for concurrency. I'll talk more in a minute. And statistical analysis, I have a very specific thing I have in mind here, and I'm totally going to borrow from the hardware guys on, on using this. So absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Testing only finds errors, does not find correctness. And it's even more true with rare probabilistic failures. So in the end, all these techniques, the code reviews, the unit testing, the static analysis, the load testing, the, the statistical testing, they're all subject to diminishing returns. I would love to say I have a silver bullet. I don't. I have not seen anyone have a silver bullet here. Um, I do them all and it's worth it. They, they each have strengths where the others fail. Um, and any serious concurrent, you know, large concurrent project I've run, I end up having all of the above running always, all the time, and you pull out the different tools for the different pieces, and uh, you know, and the different debugging technologies for the different pieces, you know, for the different kinds of problems you run into. So let's talk about code reviews. One slide, really quick. Expensive and effective. Okay, um, it's effective. It can spot bugs that rarely occur in practice because this is your eye looking and saying, "What if? What if this happened?" And then this. And then the user decided to cancel his account and make a new one and da 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 can, can spot bugs that don't happen on specific hardware, like desktop versus mobile apps, right? You get a different uh, concurrency model if you're at the binary level on an x86 who's an AMD, but if you're doing like reactive programming on one and different reactive on the other, you have the different, you know, different uh, timing of things between the two. And generally improves uh, code comment qualities all around. Might require a culture shift if you haven't done it. It's worth it. If, you're, if your company's not doing code reviews, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, there's other people who can step you through going from a non-code review culture to a code review culture. I don't want to talk about it here. It's worth it. Trust me on this one. Okay, static analysis, like fine bugs. Um, check that certain rules apply. Um, like that I have an annotation saying, I hold this lock when I access this field. So they're highly automatable. You're going to have a lot of false positives, have a plan to deal with false positives. You'll find bugs has a lot of support to filtering uh, uh, you know, false positives that you've de declared false before. Nonetheless, you get a lot of them, you have to deal. Um, but an uh, annotations here, as opposed to big flashy comments, it's another version of a big flashy comment, if you will. It's very helpful for both humans and automated tools. Annotate your code, and here I'm doing something with concurrency, and and then you can start to diagnose bugs there. Okay, unit testing. So the basic goal of unit testing is have something very simple that I can validate works as it stands. If I can do an X, can I do a Y? But now take that into the concurrent realm. If I do ten X's in parallel, do ten Y's also work? Usually, if you haven't thought through your concurrent issues very well. Just running 10 in parallel would immediately be on bugs. You'll see deadlock testing and you'll get currency issues. You'll have crashes of various kinds. But then there's load testing. And that's where I do a million X's in parallel. And then I'm doing a million Y's at the same time. And do I expect performance to be about a million times slower than doing one? What happens here, the difference between 10 and a million, is you get into the rare timing events become common. You get some live lock testing, but you get like jitted code has been done long ago, and now you're running the jitted code for performance. You get a blend of jitted and interpreted code running for performance. You have GC pauses happening while you're running your damn thing. So you, you don't know what's the way to year for a million, you know, day long things. That's too slow. But if I have something that's pretty modest and gets over with in a second or two, I'll run it a million times. And then it's right, a millisecond or two, and I'll run it, and it'll take 10, 20 minutes. And in that time, I'll probably get some fails. And when that doesn't fail, I have a confidence I could run it for weeks without fail. Right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's a big difference between doing it once. Well, once you do 10 and clean those bugs out, you're, it's pretty easy to scale it to a million 
And after the million, you're pretty solid. Okay, let's talk about some framework issues, unit testing framework issues. Suppose I have a test harness, and I'm going to run some tests. And not to blame anyone in particular here, uh, but maybe you'll recognize some of my little sort equals. So I have a bounded blocking queue. I've made it a size one because I'm trying to test the queue full, queue empty behavior. So I'll put some things in the queue, and then take some things out of the queue. But of course, the queue's of depth one. So at the second put, it stalls, and that stalled the test harness, and the entire test suite just hung there indefinitely. Uh, that's no good. So you have to do something about that. How about exceptions? Well, the default behavior is exceptions are silently ignored. So the test says, put it ABC, launch another thread, take the thing out, see that it's an oops. Oh, it's not an oops. You throw an exception. The join point throws the exception from the other thread away, and the test silently completes with no failure. So the test lies to you. Very bad. Don't do it. Okay, what do we do instead? We do controlled interleaving, white box testing, where we're going to force a tick tock, tick tock behavior where I make the, 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 the test step forward in exactly the order I want. We'll see in here in a second what I'm talking about. It. But I can move it forward at, at debugging speeds. I can stop it in my debugger, and it will still take the same thread ordering between events exactly one after another. Um, it requires new testing support harness. It doesn't, I don't know of a, of a default test harness that has this built, baked in. But there's an internal clock that ticks and talks, and you block until a tick, and you advance on the other thread until a tick, and you go back and forth taking turns, right? Much more robust against like putting sleep set. And you can force narrow uh, races or blocking conditions. So here's a, here's a little more example where I want to uh, 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 put something in my buffer queue and then wait till it's full and then put another thing in and the other guy has to get. And I want to make sure that I've hit like the buffer full condition. So the advance only happens uh, uh, until, you know, you'll get tick only advances until everyone's blocked. So the starter is both threads race. One race is to wait for tick one and one race is to put something in. But the wait for tick then stalls until he's going to see tick one. And the other guy completes with no contention because the other thread two wasn't doing anything. Then he says, get a tick. If they're both stalled, then he advances and he goes to the next put. But the, the first guy can go get ABC out from a blocking condition. The second guy is going to block until the ABC gets removed. Then he's going to unblock and hit the next get tick and wait. And the second guy gets his next get death. Anyhow, I'm forcing the ordering here. That's the, that's the takeaway goal. Okay, um, let's talk about load testing again. So it's easy to say, do X a million times, and that's actually kind of reasonable for sort of batch processing testing or big data where I have a billion things and I can say, go run this test over a billion things. But it's highly unrealistic for irregular computations, which need a, a mixture of requests and timing. Um, and, and in particular, web services don't get nothing, and then a million of a one page, and then nothing again. That's just not realistic. So if you if you test your web service by saying curl a million times of this URL, a couple fails happen. You only test it one web page. You don't get a second request until the first completes, and therefore you have no overlapping requests. There's nothing blended here in between the requests. They're all one after another, after another, after another. It's not a realistic test. And in particular, that you don't test any concurrency. It's all single threaded testing. So you get unrealistic thread latency reports back. If you want to know how fast my web server responds, you don't know. You get total lies back. Um, you also lo don't look at any bursty behavior and you don't look at any concurrency behavior. So you have to fire off requests in a more realistic distribution and having the fire off independent of the results. So let me break that down. So the, a, a common way to view standard web requests is you have an exponential distribution of requests coming in, which means you have long periods of idle and you have spikes. Okay. The next one is you fire off a request independent of results. That is, you can't wait for this to come back before the next request goes out. Because if I'm requesting Google search and you're requesting Google search, our requests are independent and we fire them off independently, independent of when those results come back. Right? So your loading tool has to be parallel and concurrent as well. And I highly recommend you look at Gil Tenney's work on jitter meter and uh, J histogram to go see uh, uh, you know, good thinking, and he has some good videos on uh, uh, the right kinds of do it. But if you look at my little example at the bottom here, you don't want the thing on the left 
where the second request waits for the first response to turn because the load harness is waiting for a response and fires off the next request. You want the second picture, the one on the right, where the multiple requests compiling in and now your, your web server is actually running concurrent and handling concurrent load. So another issue with load testing is a lab versus production environment. The, the production guys are making the money. And so they have a full size setup running the full network and a full size database and a full size gear because that's where the company makes its money is off the production server. But that means the lab guys can't test a production setting unless they have a similar setup. And that's kind of expensive to double that, which means you don't get good testing, which means the production guys know the labs guys stuff is shit because it's not tested under load. So they're really, you know, don't want to take things from the labs guys because they can't test it. Real conflict leads to horrible issues where the labs have some really cool stuff that never makes it production because production guys are nervous to go turn it on because it's not been tested in production or in a production like environment. It's worth spending that hardware to go from the lab on the left to the lab on the right. right? You need a production setup there. Okay, now let's talk about statistical testing. This is not your, your usual statistical testing. Suppose I have a test, I have a fail. I get it occasionally in testing. I get it, you know, pretty common in production. It's hard to repeat, never fails the debug on my desktop, never fails the debug logic um, or print S. What do I do? I same solutions hardware guys, I use statistics, right? You, you defeat randomness with statistics. You're gonna repeat until, and you're gonna count the failure rate. So what does it mean to repeat until? Get a machine, you dedicate to the problem, and you run it hard under heavy load over and over and over again, days at a time. Don't debug the crashes, count the crashes, and then clean up and run again. And you see what the failure rate is. What you get out of that is a guaranteed fail box, right? And maybe it takes days or just some large X counter runs to make the fail happen. But you want to know what the failure rate is because you don't know you have it fixed until you go well past X runs without the fail, right? Now that you have a box that fails in whatever time frame it takes, I've had it take a day, um, you can start adding debugging info, logging, printouts, that kind of stuff. Failure rate doesn't change, you're probably not close to the bug because you're changing timing in other places that don't matter. But the failure rate drops off, you're tweaking something important near the bug. You're getting close to it. And you can now zero in on the bug, sort of at a once a day, right before evening comes, I set my desktop up to run the hamburger bug and, and the re, you know, infinite repeat cycle, just count fails, do my tweak and I go home. When I come back in the morning, I look at the log file and I count my success and failures and, I, and I, it's, it's a slow, but it, it works. I, get, I make progress. Um, I can zero in. And once you have a, a, a bug fix in hand, now you can test to make sure that you actually have a bug fix in hand that you didn't just fake it or actually just go to the next bug because you probably have a couple different bugs interlocked and that's why you're having trouble finding the one because there wasn't one there were several and they were, they were interlocking with each other but the box can be used to test enough right it can be verified that you are actually got the bug so you know the general rule here is that probabilistic events require many runs and you track them with statistics and that works same at, for software as it does for hardware. Okay, I'm gonna talk briefly about distributed application testing. Um, I, mostly I'm gonna say what I said about parallel mostly works for distributed as well. Replace you know, data race in a shared memory box with a network race in a shared cluster. Replace how many threads do I wanna test with and launch and load test with how many nodes? And I'll claim five nodes is a good start because you have people in the middle, people on the end of your cluster and people in the middle, and it's an odd number and it's a prime number and a bunch of things get screwy there. Um, I, I've had good luck with five, whereas three didn't seem to test certain corner cases reliably. Fine. You can do this with virtual boxes or even five processors processes on the same box up to a point. As soon as you do virtual boxes or processes within the same real hardware, uh, your network costs drop. And if your network costs get really low, you don't have realistic network latency or network fails. And you need the real latencies to see real interleavings. Same as the parallel case. So you know, a couple of things you can do, you can eject network failures directly, I've totally done that. Um, testing my you know, reliable UDP, I had to have 
drop your key packets that I reliably retested, you know, re reset. Or broken TCP connections where, you know, for me, it's Comcast, the local not beloved cable provider, decides at any given moment in time, you've been running a TCP connection too long, he just cuts it and sees if you'll restart it. Whatever, you have to have retry logic. So that needs testing. So you wrote the retry logic, you have to test it too, right? Load testing, statistical testing, these things all apply. The cheaper printing that I use to debug H2O applies network, same as uh, it does for concurrent shared memory. Okay, uh, and then here I'm just gonna wrap it up. We're gonna be done here in a second. So writing data races, there's a couple anti-patterns to look at. Double check locking went around the, the industry some years ago pretty widely. Um, you know, it's test a global, synchronize, test under lock now, it's still not there, so go write it. Unless global's a volatile, your code is wrong. And you will fail rarely, but it will happen. Um, double reader with a rare writer, and it's usually a null writer, and it's usually hidden by accessors. So I say something like, if has a foo, then get the foo and do it. And the problem here is that between has a foo and get a foo, I did two loads, and in between, the, the null writer came, and so the git gets a null, and I crash and burn. You have to get rid of the accessors and load a single value, which has some kind of uh, a poison on it that tells you that's not available. If it's not going to be available, the common poison's null. But you can use other versions of poison there. Uh, multiple calls to thread-safe collections are not thread-safe between calls. Here's a piece of code, so I crunched it down to two lines, where I go look at my cache, and if I get something out of my cache and I test and that cache says, no, oops, I didn't have it. So my cache is thread safe because I'm using, say, concurrent uh, or non-blocking hash map. I compute the value, store it in a temp, and put it in the cache. This is buggy because two racing writers can be first racing readers and race and miss on temp twice. Then, because they've missed, they both got a null, they both compute two values for temp, two different values for temp. They both put two different values for temp in, and the concurrent hash map survives that and takes one of the two, and the other one is lost. Then they roll forward with two different temps, each thinking they have the shared common copy. And they perhaps do updates to uh, both, but only one of the updates sticks, the one that's in the hash table, the other one gets dropped on the floor as soon as Red's done with it, because there's no point to it anymore because it's not in the hash table. Okay. So writing data races is often hidden by good programming practice. You're using accessors to help you solve a large, complicated problem. You have a big problem, otherwise all life is easy, but it's not because you're doing something big and complicated, fine. You're using abstraction and accessors to make the problem tractable, to give meaning to it. So in the context of this big, complicated problem, these accessors make total sense, but you needed speed. So you brought in concurrency and threads to do parallel overlapping work. And then the pitfall is you end up adding concurrency to a large complicated problem. And you fail to recognize that concurrency is its own complicated problem. It may not be large, but it can very much be very subtle and complicated. It needs a different kind of wrappers and access control, a different kind of an API. It's, it's not really a bolt-on after the fact kind of feature. It typically requires you to, to rethink or sort of from first principles, how the hell the program is supposed to work. I talk to data race victims and they will start out thinking they know what's going on. And by the time we're done, they'll realize they didn't know what was going on. They don't know what threads can tell what, which data variables, when and where, and they didn't have any control over the situation. And they're always surprised by the interleaving that triggers the bug. And why are they surprised? Because if they weren't surprised, they would have found the bug. But they never thought to look where the bug is. And so it's always a shock to them. Like, what the hell? Oh my God, that can happen. And then they're there. So best answer, don't write concurrent bugs, right? Where you can avoid it. Use the immutable object pattern, use private data, use well-tested job util concurrency libraries. But you know, when you must, because sometimes you do, that's just part of performance work, admit to yourself, here be dragons. Think before you write and document, document, document. And that is it. And I have 10 minutes to go and I burned through. Yeah. Okay, guys. You have to tell me now what goes on. I think it's Q&A here and I don't have a, a chat window unless it shows up. I see you, I see my, my technical hosts. Is that where the chat shows up? 
And I don't have sound from you yet. Let me go look at Zoom. No, uh, I have vMix working. Oh, I have Discord working. I still have no sound. <laughs> okay. You've, you've cut me, I take it. Oh, I hope. hope uh, yeah, no problem. Everybody hears me now. So thank you, Cleve, for, uh, for sharing your experience on how to deal with data analysis, how to avoid the typical ones. Uh, I would say that the best advice is uh, don't write in concurrent bugs, because if you don't have bugs, you don't have to deal with them. And uh, uh, yeah, we have uh, about nine minutes, and we have uh, uh, several questions uh, from the audience and, uh, of course, from us as well. And uh, the first question is related to, to the tools. So you mentioned. Uh, uh, th that uh, you use find bugs uh, tool for static analysis, but uh, uh, there are more approaches, of course. So you can use some dynamic uh, analysis tools, you can use uh, model checking, and so, so on. So, could you please share yeah. your experience with uh, uh, these approaches? Yeah, okay. So, um, for a long time, I looked for a long time. Uh, for tools that would not involve like 10 and 20x slowdowns um, because they're very difficult to use in practice. And, and such tools with only a 10x slowdown also typically were very hard to use. And I never found anything that would deal with Hotspot, for instance. It just, it just couldn't scale and they didn't handle the, the, all the weird ass things. Um, the tooling has gotten better. It's still not what I would claim very good. So um, I, I don't have any more experience uh, outside of model checking. I don't have any more experience on the tooling other than to say from 20 years ago to five years ago, I looked hard and there were never any tools that were any good. Not for a production setting, not that I want to use in my, you know, my, my engineering teams. Um, if you find one, that's great. I, you should promote it loudly. Um, the other option, of course, is if you become an expert in a particular tool that's very hard to use, but because you're an expert, you can use it, and then that's useful to you, and that's also possible. Um, but I didn't didn't want to end up trying to drag you know 100 engineers through the ins and outs of some particular random tooling, which complained something we're not even sure if it was a bug or it was just a false positive. You know, these have high false positives. Model checking, on the other hand, I've done a number of times um, with good success. Um, it's slow, but it was also a, it's not a thing to repeat and test things. It's not a QA, it's, it's a design tool, not a QA testing tool. Because once you've passed the model checking, um, you're done, you know, the, the thing works. And, and, and no more, if you don't touch the code, you don't have to go debug again, or you don't have to go ask the model checker. If you change the code, you have to go ask the model checker again. Um, I'm using model checking even now for different, different things. That's a, uh, you can design for model checking. Um, for me, it's it's I, I'm really using it for uh, state machines, and I'm exploring a large state space. That's basically what a model checker does. And uh, uh, you can make the code or gear your code up such it's more friendly to being attacked by an official model checker. I typically look at smaller state spaces, so I roll my own model checker, which is just a state space exploration tool. It's not very hard. It's like a couple of nested for loops and a big work list kind of thing. Um, if you want to get more official, there are some very aggressive model checkers that handle much bigger problem spaces that I typically end up looking at. I have used them. I've had grad students use them on my behalf. Um, yeah, model checking works. It only, it only handles a certain kind of problem, and you have to very exactly, very specifically define what it is your concurrent algorithm is and what all the parts are. And if you miss any part, then it fails to get model checked. And the model checker is super slow, so you don't want to model check very often. Um, but yeah, but but if you can set up to use a model checker, do it. Probably sometimes you can use uh, model checking uh, within your testing if you check some algorithms. So when you don't need to check the whole system, the whole application, but you have a yeah. particular algorithm and uh, you need to check them it somehow so that you can use uh, typical unit testing as well as model checking, I guess. So, uh, yeah, like I said, the model check... 
while checking is too slow to use it all the time, um, it, 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 you're, you're better off uh, uh, using it as a developer tool when the core algorithm changes. And then, you know, once, once you pass the model checker, you're done. And, and unit testing is a different story. Yeah, I probably would uh, totally agree with you. So I do agree that model checking is uh, slow, but uh, uh, in our tool that we develop at JetBrains for testing concurrent algorithms, we do use model checking as one of the strategies, and it works pretty well. Nice. But, uh, but it works uh, good only because we use it for small algorithms. I mean, we don't yep. uh, use it for complicated algorithms. And of course, we have a bounded model checking. So we. Uh, we don't even try to search yeah. all the internal links. And yeah, 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 yeah. To it's usually, the, yeah. Have you tried go to, ahead, use the, to, to use a Java Pathfinder? So it's not so the... Well, um, I, I, you know, there's been follow-ons. I'm sorry, say again then, I missed. So just for the audience, try use... uh, Java Pathfinder is a tool that yeah. uh, uh, allows you to uh, apply model checking for your uh, for your Java code, so it transfers a GVM byte code to the special language. No, I have not used it. I have not heard about it either. So you know, it sounds sounds good to me. Uh, um, I will take a look afterwards here. Okay, I've heard of the tool. This is this is another Bill Pew tool. Don't worry about it. Carry on here. I'll, I'll go hunt it up in a minute. It's not a new tool, of course, uh, so it was developed maybe 10, 15 years ago, I don't remember. But an odd one. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, uh, pro probably yeah. you have any experience with uh, thread sanitizer. And uh, as far as I know, uh, there is even a JEP, uh, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, th currently there is no work in progress about uh, incorporating a thread sanitizer into JDK. And, um, well, uh, I watched a video by guys from Google, if I'm not mistaken, it was three years ago, um, from Java Language Summit, and uh, they told about uh, work they made, and uh, there were some problems with C2, and probably that is why you should know about this. So, um, the thread sanitizer that I'm aware of, I just looked up to make sure, I'm reading the same, I think the same thing, has the, the usual 10x slowdown issue. Um, uh, and then that's slow enough to cause all kinds of other problems when doing, uh, you know, JVM development work. So we tried 20 years ago to use a bunch of these tools, including that version of sanitizer from 20 years ago, and it simply did not handle hotspot. The, the other thing going on here is that if you have a, a 10x slowdown, um, you have a problem that the, the application under test has internal timeouts and the time progresses in real time for it. And it begins to time out internally and you simply can't load test uh, a production server with a 10x slowdown. It, you know, you just endl endlessly throw timeouts on transactions instead of actually doing sort of the real work the server's supposed to be doing. So I have not used sanitizer in a very long time. The time I used it, it was not ready to go. What I just read seconds ago says it's still 10x slowdown. Don't know if that's going to work adequately or not. Doesn't necessarily seem good. Uh, click. Okay. There's another one of small problems. Excuse me for interruption. If you have a small uh, problem, uh, yeah. we are, we ran yeah. out of time. Um, just a quick reminder that uh, we are going to be live uh, in the um, in the chat uh, in uh, um, well in Zoom. Yep. Uh, we can uh, take up all the questions that uh, rest uh, here and uh, so far. Uh, thank you, Cliff, for your talk.